Okay, so uh, we are going to continue um, to the first uh, function for logic, which he has nicknamed uh, Dogmatist. Now, personally, um, he does kind of give it a more positive spin right off the bat, but I I have a lot of issues with this, with uh, the content of this uh, this section here with first logic. Um, I consider myself I consider myself a first logic uh, type, um, and he gets a lot of things like not just off, but like wrong, <laughs> where it. It's like he, I could understand the direction he was going, like why he went, he, why he went in the way he did, but it's off and it doesn't at all align with my experiences with uh, other first logic types and my own, you know, life and uh, psychology. Um, so like right off the rat, uh, right off the rip, like he has this nickname dogmatist and I don't like it because it, it almost gets at what first logic is like, but it, it misses the mark. Um, when people think of like a dogmatist, most of the time you're thinking of somebody who is, uh, like they're, they're they're following a external uh, system, an external code, um, an external ideology. And there's this sense that like, they are dogmatic about something not of their own creation. And uh, they're, it's almost like there's a sense of being like a follower kind of loaded into the word dogmatist. Now, as he talks about when I get into actually reading this and not blathering, um, the word dogmatist doesn't, doesn't mean what the popular, um, you know, what the vernacular meaning does today. But yeah, the reason why I would just caution against thinking of like one else is just dogmatist is because, um, yeah, the word has too much of a loading of, external authority whereas like really what 1L is like is rule bound and those rules can be something external but oftentimes they're not um, and oftentimes the 1L will in fact make it seem as if the external rules that they are they have bound themselves by are actually of their own creation or that they're just obvious they're so obvious that they're not anybody's creation they're just the obvious fact they're the obvious thing that anyone should think um so i don't know if this i don't know if my commentator here is maybe i don't know if it's gonna not make sense but i'm not sure if it's gonna be impactful to anyone but i would just say that yeah, the word dogmatist, I think, gives the wrong, it gives the wrong flavor to 1L. I would say really what it, what it is is that 1Ls are, are rule bound. Um, they feel, uh, they feel that they need to act in accordance with a, a system, a set of rules, principles. Um, they are possessed by logic like the first functions are kind of possessed by the aspect like first emotion is like possessed by emotion first will is possessed by will you know first physics is possessed by the body by the physical and tangible reality and so one l's are like possessed by logic so it's like they are you know, they can be almost like robotic in their following of what they think is, is the truth. So that, that can seem dogmatic, but I wouldn't, I just don't want people to think that, um, one L's are just sourcing their logic from something external, although they might, they might act as if that's the case. I don't think that's necessarily the case. So 
again, I'm not sure if that that commentary is helpful at all, but let's let's get into it. Uh, the title dogmatist itself in this case has a double meaning. Today, according to which a dogmatist is considered a person incapable of changing once acquired truths, and in the ancient meaning of this word, when a dogmatist was understood as a thinker prone to monologue, affirmative form, a monologuing affirmative form of intellectual activity, in a counterweight to the dialectist, the dialectictist, <laughs> di maybe dialectician is better, uh, pr who preferred a dialogical interrogative form. Okay. Um, in principle, both meanings, both modern and ancient Greek, are equally applicable to the first logic, since the internal psychological form formulation of logic is reflected only in the way of thinking, but not in its quality, a dogmatist can turn out to be both a great sage and an impassable idiot. I, I do agree with that. Um, first logic is un united by the effectiveness of thinking and what the results are in a purely individual manner. Okay, so in other words, um, you know, whatever your IQ and your actual skill and your knowledge, um, that's kind of besides the point because psych psychic type, psychotype, is not uh, perfectly correlated with your your actual innate abilities. Um, it's more of a self-perception. So, you know, first logic types could be a sage, they could be an idiot. Um, among the external signs of the first logic, the most notable and not noticeable and indicative is the unambiguously affirmative form of communication. Even when a dogmatist seems to be asking, it does not follow that he is waiting for an answer, and the question itself is usually posed in such a way that it contains a deliberate assessment. For example, a question like, did you hear what that idiot said? Obviously does not imply an unbiased exchange of opinions. For this reason, and I think that's kind of a that's kind of a poor example because it just seems very um, like crude. And I think he could have used a much better example to uh, convey his point, um, like kind of like a loaded question or like a rhetorical question um, could have could have been better than that, that, you know, very like extreme version of it. Uh, for this reason, Communication with the first logic in general can be considered quite difficult. The communication of a dogmatist is so despotic that, converse, that the conversation willy-nilly comes down to a monologue. It can be interesting, useful, brilliant, or conversely boring, aimless, miserable, but it will still be a report, a speech, not a conversation. Uh, I would say that um, in this case, Perhaps that is true, but only insofar as the conversation is about logic, um, if we could narrow it down. And usually conversations go back and forth between different things. You're talking about, the, you know, even within an intellectual discussion, you know, there certainly are going to be elements of emotion and will and physics like bound up in that and entwined in that discussion. So it's like, yeah, if you could pick apart the actual logical portions, then sure, that may be the case, but don't think that all communication uh, is this way. I think that would be a, that would be a mistake. So uh, the monologue quality of the first logic is irresistible, even when it tries to speak on someone else's behalf and reproduce a dialogue intonation that is fundamentally alien to itself. This was the case, for example, with the great dogmatist Plato, who vainly imitated the style of his teacher Socrates until nature took its toll and he finally reduced his Socratic dialogues to pure monologues, on the title of which is the name of Socrates, a lover and expert of communication, was already an ob obvious fiction. So, yeah, he's just trying to he's trying to contrast, uh, you know, Plato using Socrates as a puppet. I don't know. Like, a, you know, Socrates was a dialectician. He was he was dialogical. You know, he later says that Socrates is a 2L type, but he thinks Plato is a 1L. I mean, for Socrates, yeah, I could definitely see um, 2L or at least, like, process logic for him. His uh, reasoning for Plato being 1L, not as, not as sure of that, um, but perhaps. Uh, but, yeah, he's trying to say that, you know, you can see Plato's 1L even though it's in the form of a dialogue. Okay. 
unfortunately, the dogmatist is not talkative. Um, and I just realized now that I don't have my, uh, my screen is not capturing. So I wonder if, let's see, little technical difficulties here. Uh, let's go here. Okay. So yeah, that, that should, that should come up. Okay. Fortunately, the dogmatist is not talkative. Um, has the ability to hear and is in, okay, so the, do, the dogmatist is not talkative and I think it's supposed to be like, he, he is, he's not talkative and he has the ability to hear and is in no hurry to speak out on any of the proposed topics. So I think it's supposed to be like, the dogmatist is not talkative, he in fact can listen, and he's not in a hurry to speak out on any of the proposed topics. He allows himself to start a monologue only in comfortable conditions, i.e. in connection with issues in which he considers himself competent. How solid this opinion about oneself turns out to be is another question. So in other words, um, whether or not he is actually competent in those subjects, what matters is that if he considers himself competent, he may make himself a fool by saying something that actually is wrong. If someone in the, you know, if a conversationalist knows better, but if he, the one owl will remain silent about things he thinks that he is not competent in, and he will monologue in things that he thinks he's competent in. Um, the main thing is that when discussing topics in which the dogmatist floats or has no information at all, he prefers to remain silent. Um, and I do think that is noticeable and true. Um, and it is very, uh, it is, well, how would I would describe this? It's very like blatant with one else where there's this like very sharp divide between like, I know this. And then it's like, Nope, I don't know that. And it's like, okay, nope, I know nothing about that. And it's like, yep, you know, you can you can talk, give me a monologue, provide me information, um, and I'll learn something from you. But it's like I have, you know, I don't know about that. Or, uh, I only know so much. Like one else will give um, very like concrete answers with things like like yeah, I know that to like this extent, but otherwise I don't. And if they know something, then they're just very like you know, yes, I know this, and, like, I know this absolutely. So, one else are honest about what they do and do not know, um, or at least what they think they do, do and do not know. So, in this, I think the caution characteristic of the first logic is manifested. So, the char their characteristic caution. Um, she does not know how to communicate outside of the affirmative form, and discovery during a cavalry attack on the topic of the inconsistency of her first, the supporting and most powerful function, is fraught with self-destruction of the indiv individual. So in other words, um, they, they only communicate that I know this or I do not know this, and discovery... Um, discovery of being wrong about something... Um, so it says discovery during a cavalry attack. I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I know cavalry attacks usually are from the flank, right? So it's like getting a discovery, like un, an unwitting discovery or like a surprise discovery, um, on the, on something that they thought they were certain of. And then later they turn out to be dead wrong about is a very uncomfortable, um, situation because, the individual is possessed by logic. So to be wrong is like kind of shattering their self concept and self identity. So, you know, I've seen some people in the, you know, psychosophy, attitudinal psyche community say that, um, you know, being wrong and being disturbed by being really upset with being proven wrong, especially publicly is something that's only concerned that three L's are only concerned with. And it's like, no, I mean, right here, Afanasiev, like, says, and quite reasonably so, that, no, that's something that, like, one owls, as well as, one, you know, as well, they also, um, they also find that disturbing, and it makes sense why, right? Um, just like 
you know, a, a, a first will type, if they were like bested, you know, or if they were shown to be of the weaker will, you know, don't you think that would kind of irk them, right? <laughs> um, so in any case, another reason for the silence of the first logic, lack of gift and taste for discussion. Uh, in disputes with a dogmatist, truth is not born. It is either affirmed or rejected. There is no third. And this is this is kind of true. It's it's difficult, or there's a sense in which discussion is not fruitful, um, and instead uh, you're either like pr I guess proving something that was already known or rejecting someone's you know amateur proposition or amateur um, contradiction. So an example would be how, uh, you know, some people prefer, but like, let's say, it, uh, some sort of topic comes up and people in a conversation aren't sure what the answer is. Um, you know, perhaps processional logic types, um, would prefer to like argue it out amongst themselves, whether such and such is true. Whereas a results logic type, including first logic, would prefer just to like Google it, right? Because um, the idea that the, the processing logic will come to some like greater understanding is is downplayed. It's not that's not natural to results logic, and it's not interesting. What is interesting is the truth. It's like get to the result, get to the you know get to the actual um, the end goal, right? So just Google it, you know. <laughs> So yeah, there's there's a sense that discussion is, it's <clears throat> you have to take this with a grain of you know you have to not a grain of salt but you have to you have to take this lightly because I am a one L I've known many other one Ls throughout my life and we did we enjoy discussing I'm I'm using finger quotes here discussing like logical things but it's more about a reporting of facts and truths and ideas that we have come to or learned about and less of a there's there's not this there's a sort of conceit with 1L that what the information we're bringing to the table is complete and accurate and is is good to go you know it's like it's ready to be shipped right whereas the process logic types uh, 2L and 3L they're skeptical of that and they're like, no, 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 we need to process it and I need to have my input and there needs to be exploration and then we'll come to the truth after we hash it out. Um, so maybe that that <clears throat> um, kind of explains it a little bit better. But uh, usually he goes to a debate with a homemade weapon, a club of absolute truth, with which he sometimes very effectively silences, a, his, silences his opponent. But the home preparation of the first logic is equally inherent in both strength and weakness. Uh, a trivial question that shifts to the perspective of the topic, an irrelevant remark, and even simple nonsense uh, throws the dogmatist out of balance and closes, excuse me, closes his mouth. And while he is trying to assemble the structure of his home speculative circuit, which is crumbled after a failure, a painful silent scene ensues. Painful for the first logic and unpleasant for the listeners. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that would be pretty, uh, you know, that would be amusing to uh, three L's particularly to watch. But yeah, I think that makes sense. And it it makes sense with the way um, the other's negative uh, functions, which is the first and third, the way they, they, the way they kind of act, you know, being skeptical of outside influence, they can kind of prepare themselves um they put they have a protective barrier against the world against change and in this case against being you know coming to a logic that you know if, if you truly feel as though you have the truth already um you know there isn't there's a tendency to ignore um other people and to ignore their input because why why would you want to waste time you know, hearing their spiel when you've already figured it out yourself. Now that sounds very conceited, and it is because all the first functions have a conceit. They're all sort of prideful. Um, but yeah, so first logic in a debate, 
they'd be like, okay, what's this debate about? And like, okay, I'm going to craft the absolute, like just a nuclear bomb. Like <laughs> first one owl goes, cause remember the first function is like a hammer. It's, it's excessive and it's somewhat cruel and it, it, do, it has no mercy. So one owl would be like, okay, what's the topic of the debate? Okay, what are my thoughts and opinions about this? Okay, blah, 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 Let me do my research. I'm gonna get my sources, facts in order, and I'm gonna get to the absolute, like, just utter truth of it, and I'm gonna come out with these big whoppers, and if the one owl is competent, is in fact competent beyond their self-perception, but is actually competent, then they'll win debate and just smoke the opponent. Um, and, you know, people will kind of be left like dumbfounded, right? Because of just the excessiveness of the, the, the truth and the, um, the, the power of the reason involved, the rationale. But if the one owl is incompetent or ill-prepared, then they will simply, <laughs> they'll sit there without much of an ability to continue because they don't have that natural practice of, you know, quick wit um and the ability to like pivot because it's not the first function unlike the second is not it's not agile it's more it has fortitude and strength but it's not agile uh sorry for all the the commentary on this but i feel as if this one um it gets a little loopy in a moment so uh this happened for example with the moths the moth demosthenes uh, being an or orator by profession, he was a dogmatist in his way of thinking. Therefore, he never, even in, in extreme cases, spoke impromptu, but always first wrote and memorized his speech at home and only then went to the podium with it. Everything would be fine, but the rowdy Athenian people often interrupted the speaker with shouts, and here Demosthenes became so tetanous that he lost the power of speech and left the podium speechless onto which his party comrade, uh, Demades, who was able to respond more flexibly to the challenge of the crowd, immediately climbed up. Okay, that's a, that's a pretty good example. Uh, a dogmatist is generally slow-witted, a stayer, not an intellectual sprinter. Uh, he, as the Russians say, is strong in hindsight. The English call it humor on the stairs. So humor on the stairs is when, uh, let's say there's you know, you're at a party and, you know, it's friendly, right? And there's some, like, funny banter. Um, and then you walk down the stairs and right as you get to the bottom of the stairs, you think of something really funny or witty that you could have said, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's that's what humor on the stairs means. Um, so he does not have a taste for discussion and does not enter into it unless absolutely necessary. Uh, Darwin admitted, I am not endowed with the ability to grasp on the fly or the sharpness of mind that so amazes us in gifted people. For example, in Huxley, accordingly, I am an unimportant critic. Okay. So, you know, perhaps smart, perhaps, you know, strong in terms of logic and gripped by logic, but not, not very agile, not quick on the fly with logic. Okay. Um, the third reason for the silence of the first logic hostility to idle chatter, hypotheses, and private opinion in general. The dogmatist seeks absolute truth, not opinion. Only absolute truth can be laid as a brick into the intellectual support that the first logic builds for itself. Hence the outright alienation and even hostility that the dogmatist experiences towards chatter, um, uh, is this to, to do chatter, hypotheses, and opinions. One of the scientists who knew Einstein closely wrote, Getting closer to the absolute truth was most important for him. In this endeavor, he did not know delicacy and did not spare the pride of his opponents. Uh, I will not say that the dogmatist himself is not the author of hypotheses. So in other words, he's saying that, like, yes, the dogmatist is in fact the author of hypotheses. Um, there are also very often ridiculous hypotheses that one else will make. Um, another thing is that he doesn't, He is that he usually, well, another thing is that Usually, he doesn't consider them as such, meaning he doesn't consider them ridiculous. He doesn't consider them to such an extent that he is not inclined to test the fidelity of their life through experience. Uh, this does not happen out of negligence, God forbid, but because the first logic, because for the first logic, thought is primary and self-sufficient, it is objective and does not need any crutches. So in other words, they tend not to 
uh, test their hypotheses or to um, consider things ridiculous that other people might simply because to them it's like, well, if it's, if it's true and if it's reasonable and it's rational, then, you know, it's it's good to go. You know, it's like it, it doesn't need a crutch of practicality. Um, going from concept to fact and not vice versa is the usual course for the first logic. Uh, so you can see here some similarity to uh, Young's introverted thinking type. Um, who He said the same exact thing about introverted thinking. And in fact, if you read introverted thinking type, that section in chapter 10 of psychological types, it parallels very closely with this. Um, there's a couple things that are different, but yeah, it does parallel pretty strongly. So um, with this way of thinking, it is also seems natural that for a dogmatist there is no more painful spectacle than the sight of a theory struck down by a fact. One day while talking with Huxley about the nature of the tragic, someone mentioned Spencer. Ha! cried Huxley. Tragedy in Spencer's view is, de is deduction killed by fact. Uh, the dogmatist in his trust in thought, more precisely not in thought but in the first function, the function of the highest reliability, sometimes goes so far that those around him begin to classify this passion for speculation as madness. Obsession with an idea, confidence in its supervalue, reliance on logic to the detriment of fact and experience, has its own special name in psychiatry, paranoia, and it happens that such a diagnosis is made to the first logic. However, as in the case of manic depressive psychosis in the first emotion, paranoia is not a mental illness in the proper sense of the word. It is simply an extreme expression of the first logic, by nature overly trusting of speculative schemes. And if we classify paranoia as a disease, then this disease is not mental, but psychotypical, i.e. determined by the mental type of the individual. <clears throat> I don't know how, I don't think that's very true, um, that paranoia is, you know, something that one, only one else um, experience, but maybe paranoia in that narrow sense. Um, however, the clinical title, paranoia, first logic is awarded quite rarely. More often, we are talking about a borderline state usually characterized by epithets like mentor, doctrinaire, learned ass. Translation is not great for those. Um, indeed, no matter how sad it is to admit, it is the first logic with its superpower giving a person support and protection at the same time, deprives his brain of flexibility, the ability to grow, giving rise to herds of learned donkeys. Mm. Uh, the reaction that first logic reacts to any obvious stupidity, nonsense, illog illogicality, uh, which is usually perceived quite leniently by other logics, is also very reminiscent of madness. Um, deliberate nonsense, that is a direct mockery of the best, most important side of the dogmatist psyche, almost immediately unsettles him, driving him to fury, to hysteria. Uh, Paustovsky described in his memoirs uh, one of his gymnasium teachers who pathologically could not stand nonsense. The young goofball school children once soon recognized this weakness of his and barking some deliberate stupidity at the beginning of the lesson, simply knocked out the teacher, immediately leading him to a hysterical <laughs> attack and insanity. So that's pretty funny. Um, First logic may not be the best in the world, but it is definitely the most honest. So what he means there is that just because you're first logic, that doesn't mean you're you're more intelligent or more capable. It's just, again, this is like the internal hierarchy of attitudinal values, okay? But it is the most honest. So that's, that's interesting. And, you know, I'm biased, obviously, but that does seem to comport with my experience that one else tend to be very like honest and like forthright. Uh, this happens because nothing stands above logic here, and no other function twits, twists its arms to please its thinking. It does not press from above, dictating the direction and way of thinking. For a dogmatist, the lower functions can only ask and not demand. From logic, something for themselves, uh, something that works for self-interest in physics, uh, sensitivity and emotion, vanity and will, and nothing more. Uh, therefore, the first logic, like no other, is honest and pure in its speculation, and one can fully rely on the rigor of its intellectual constructions. 
Uh, so in other words, like, you know, first honest, uh, first logic it really does want to know the truth. Um, even if it fails, um, it still wants to be, it wants to know the truth. It, it, there's no other function that's above it that's, it's not being used as a means to any higher function. It's the end in itself. Um, so you can trust that a 1L um, generally uh, is reliable in how much effort they've put into being right, if that makes sense. The ability to immerse oneself in thought to the point of completely disconnecting from the outside world is noticed in a dogmatist or already in childhood. Extreme and more importantly, lonely thoughtfulness characterizes such a child. He can remain alone, out, alone for hours, busy with his thoughts, not reacting to what is happening around him. Sometimes his thought grabs him at the most inopportune moment, for example, while eating, and grabs him so strongly that the dogmatic child's gaze hardens, and the spoon hangs in the air for a long time, not reaching his mouth. The tendency for a somnambulistic, meaning sleepwalking, um, uh, absorption in thought in the first logic is well illustrated by episodes from the life of Einstein. They say that once they once saw Einstein pushing a stroller with a child on the street. Suddenly he stopped in the most inappropriate place from the point of view of traffic rules and taking a paper and pencil from his pocket began to make hasty notes. Only after finishing the recording did Einstein consider, continue moving. Or another case, wanting to celebrate the scientist's birthday as grandly as possible, friends invited Einstein to a restaurant and among other things ordered a rare delicacy, Russian caviar. When the caviar was brought, Einstein was just talking about Newton's law of inertia and its possible physical explanation. He popped the caviar into his mouth and continued uh, commenting on the law of inertia. When the caviar was eaten and the speaker stopped to put an invisible point, uh, the interlocutors asked if he knew what he ate. No, what? It was caviar. What? Was it really caviar? Einstein exclaimed sadly. So yeah, he, he was talking so much and monologuing about logic that he didn't he wasn't even aware of what he was doing. Okay. <clears throat> the memory of first logic is also distinguished by certain originality. She is good at ideas, theories, concepts, but is rather weak in terms of facts, names, dates, numbers. Um, when Einstein was asked a simple question about the speed of sound, he replied, I don't know this by heart. Why load your memory with something that can be found in any reference book? Um, Einstein's explanation is only half correct. The root of this kind of forgetfulness is in the uh, effectiveness of the dogmatic, dog, dogmatist thinking. So effectiveness, I think, meaning um, results-oriented, productive, so first function and fourth function, right? Um, he is not interested in scattered, extra-systemic, factual material because it is impossible to build on it the complete intellectual structure on which the first logic tries to rely. According to the dogmatist, facts are sand. A building material in itself is unsuitable. What makes it valuable is only a noticeable addition of the cement of thought, capable of turning grains of sand in, uh, capable of turning grains of sand of facts into that concrete. Yeah, um, I definitely agree. I mean, that's always been the way. <laughs> that's that's always something I've, I've noticed with myself is just more interested in the ideas and concepts. The, well, it, it does get a little more complicated actually, because when you add types and you, you stack the functions together, you can get kind of twists and turns in the way that these things uh, come out in the end. Um, I think with my type, it's like, yeah, I, I, I do, um, really care about the theory and the structure more than like these kind of like fiddly details. But on the other hand, in the effort to really prove something's validity and to create like a, you know, a, a model or a truly like sound, like plan of action or something. Um, I think it is extra important for my type to get the details right and to structure those details uh, you know, scientifically and statistically. So then, so I don't know if this is making sense, but um, details do matter, but for one L in a vacuum, 
in and of itself. What matters more is just kind of the structure. And again, you can see the probably the influence on Afanasiev, but at least the parallel um, between what he's saying here and Young's introverted thinking type. Um, that should be really clear to anyone who's, who's read that. Uh, do, 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 for the same reason. Okay, so this paragraph, I hate this paragraph that's coming up, and I'm going to tell you why it's wrong after I read it. Um, for the same reason, a dogmatist is usually not curious and is often poorly read. In general, if the range of his professional interests is far from the intellectual sphere, the dogmatist hardly stands up from the crowd with his baggage and does not strive to do so. His strong point is system analysis, not information storage. Niels Bohr, for example, was not considered by any of his colleagues to be a seriously erudite person, but no one denied his gigantic talent for structuring disparate facts that at first glance came into view by chance. Uh, Bohr himself said, You know I'm an amateur. When others begin to exorbitantly complicate the apparatus of theory, I cease to understand anything. I can barely think. Um, that that little bit, there's... I mean, I, I do hate it. Because um, I hate the first the first sentence. But um, there, it's not... It's really not entirely bad, I guess. But let's uh, let's go through it again. So... For the same reason, a dogmatist is usually not curious. I mean, that that doesn't seem right to me. Um, it kind of doesn't even seem in line with what he just said at being, you know, creating like ridiculous hypotheses and speculating, right? Like, isn't speculation kind of a form of curiosity? Um, maybe the Russian word <clears throat> that he was using for curious is more curious about... I don't know, like life stuff, not about logic stuff, but just about other things, like kind of a a plebeian curiosity, maybe. Um, poorly read. Now, this one bothers me. Um, you know, he did walk it back a little bit by saying, well, if the one L is not a uh, intellectual, right? And I'm sure there are plenty of one Ls that aren't. Uh, so maybe that's true, but it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm decently well-read compared to the average person, right? Um, and the 1Ls that I know are well-read. I've known many a 1L who wants nothing more to, than to be a librarian. Um, the other thing that bothers me about this is that think of the other first, the first, uh, aspects, right? Um... And we haven't gotten to physics and will yet, but I'm, I'm sure you could you could anticipate what it's going to what's going to be said about them. It's, but it's like, you know, would it be true that a first physics type doesn't want doesn't have a need for possessions? Right. It's like, well, you know, they're so complacent about physics and, you know, they don't they don't want they don't need possessions. They don't need, uh, you know, to have um to have like physical objects that they have uh, that they have control over that they um, that please them, um, it just seems wrong to me. It's like, isn't that exactly what a what a one you know a one F a first physics type would have? Like, they would kind of surround themselves with what seems like natural to them. You know, a, a, a first volition type. So you're telling me they don't surround themselves with followers and with uh, status and with, um, I don't know, like not necessarily trophies, but with like accomplishments? Um, does a 1E type not surround themselves with um, like art in their life and with, uh, I don't know, expression and theatrics or whatever? It's like, so you're telling me a 1L who values logic is unlikely to surround themselves with books and information. It's like, okay, that just seems way off to me. It's like the classic, like one L is surrounding themselves. Yes. Surrounding themselves with, uh, whether it's like physical books or whatever other sort of information, like, you know, now in the computer age, you know, people can be it people or whatever and surround themselves with, you know, 
computers and a lot of it's on the internet now, but I just, I, yeah, I just, if you're making it through my rambling here, um, yeah, I, it just seems very off to me because you would think that what comes natural to the person would, that would be something that they, and I'm, I'm saying surround themselves with, but it's like, you know, you, a one L is going to ornament their life with knowledge, right? And so being, being well read, um, f gathering information that, that seems pretty natural to them. So yeah, I just don't like, I don't like that first sentence. Um, it, it just, it seems wrong in my experience. Um, and yeah, sure. If they don't have interest in intellectual stuff, then okay, maybe they don't read, but they're still going to be, they're still likely to be like well informed about, you know, whatever their professional interests are. Um, it doesn't have to be like books. It might be instruction manuals or whatever else. Um, but fair enough about his strong point in system analysis, not information storage. I mean, okay, sure. And then Niels Bohr example, whatever, but <clears throat> okay. A dogmatist is a philosopher, a philosopher even when his occupation is formally far from philosophy. Okay, I, I agree with that. Um, a tendency to, to think, right? For example, Einstein and Bohr are usually considered physicists, but in fact they were natural philosophers and were much closer to Democritus than to Rutherford. Uh, the philosophical inclinations of the dogmatists can be explained by the fact that the thinking of the first logic is initially strategic and tends to create closed universal systems. Uh, to connect with thought, everything that exists in the world is an, uh, is an unattainable goal, but one that the dogmatist constantly sets before himself. That, that, that seems very true to me. Um, as another famous physicist, uh, Hevesy, wrote, the thinking mind does not feel happy until it manages to connect together the disparate facts that it, that it observes. This intellectual unhappiness, most of all, encourages us to think to do science. The conceit of a dogmatist regarding the abilities of his mind extends far and wide. George Eliot once asked Spencer why with such intense work he had no visible wrinkles on his forehead. Uh, this is probably because I am never puzzled, replied the famous scientist. Okay, I mean, that, that seems like a joke to me, but okay. You know, use it as an example, I guess. Um, <clears throat> the dogmatist is self-confident to the point that perhaps only he is left indifferent by the general passion for crosswords, logical tests, and similar means of intellectual self-control. So, this is another weird part here. Um, he's self-confident to the point that he doesn't He's not, he doesn't really, isn't concerned by, you know, the hoi poi's passion for crossword puzzles or Sudoku um, and similar things of that nature. Now, I think that that does seem somewhat true, but I would just be careful of taking it too far and, and applying it to puzzle solving in general because, you know, 1Ls are very much like the puzzle solvers of the psychosophic world. Um, but yeah, these sorts of like easy or, you know, common puzzles. Um, yeah, perhaps they don't, perhaps they, they're not uh, interested in. Uh, but in vain, this self-confidence sometimes serves the first logic in disrepute. Because when a person's fate, hiring for a job, admission to an intellectual institution, depends on the test result, test results, the first logic does not always score high, and the point is not only in the sluggishness and tightness of the dogmatist thinking, the very assumption of the power of mind given to him by nature, not only in abundance, but even in, uh, I think, superabundance, uh, can be disputed, seems so ridiculous to the dogmatist that he sometimes considers um, straining his hemisphere simply unnecessary, hence the often more than modest results of intellectual testing of the first logic. Uh, don't know about this one. Um, well, for, I guess I'll just say the first reason is that, you know, intellectual testing, like, generally is going to correlate highly with IQ. 
and IQ is usually something that is not domain dependent. Um, yeah, I guess if you're testing for, again, domain, you know, if you're testing for domain dependent skills, meaning skills that are something you really have to like learn and you can't just generally through high IQ just understand, then like, okay, maybe this is true. I don't know, not, not in my experience, but I'm, I leave it open, I guess. Um, but <clears throat> if you're doing like logic testing, then it's gonna be completely unrelated anyway because uh, you know we're saying here the IQ is not is independent of these functions. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what more to make of this paragraph. So <clears throat> about style in its desire for laconicism, uh, first logic is very similar to first emotion. Like the romantic, the dogmatist is brief in self-expression and strives to present to human judgment only the result of his solitary, reflect, solitary ref, reflections. The raisin of thinking. To the exclusion of everything that preceded it, I, preceded it, i.e. process of rational search. For example, Einstein outlined his famous theory of re relativity on three pages, but spent 18 pages on his dissertation without even providing it with a list of references. <laughs> Um, yeah, I do think, uh, one L's, uh, are laconic, um, meaning efficient and short in speech. Um, and I agree with this, uh, this is pretty solid, uh, you know, trans transporting this metaphor he used earlier of the raisin, um, meaning like the, the gem of, of, you know, the, the real, the real item that you're searching for, the result, the product, and not being concerned with the process and like the how of doing it, um, to some extent, <clears throat> to some extent, that's true. The lapidary nature of self-expression of the first logic is rarely to its benefit and almost always to its detriment. Sometimes uh, some irreparable uh, tragic losses can be directly associated associated with it. For example, Heraclitus, the greatest and most profound philosopher of antiquity, which I, and I think you might mean like in, anti in antiquity, he was considered the most profound philosopher because I don't know if he's still considered the most profound, um, was already nicknamed the dark one during his lifetime. <laughs> and I, <coughs> I wish that was my, uh, <coughs> my nickname. Um, and only a few brilliant quotes from his entire philosophical heritage have survived to this day. Such is the bitter payment of the first logic for the high concentration of its emphatically effective style. The handwriting of a dogmatist is very recognizable. It is ugly, difficult to read, and in, and in its principles is close to shorthand. I think the inventor of shorthand had the first logic. The main formal features of dogmatic handwriting are as follows. From all variants of writing letters, the simplest and fastest is chosen, and the connections between letters are short, straight, and maximally adapted to cursive writing. In short, the handwriting of first logic is extremely rational and neglects clarity and aesthetics for the sake of speed and simplicity. Okay, so that's first logic. There's, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I, I <clears throat> did a lot of commentary on that one. Um, I guess because it's near and dear to my heart or mind, as I should say. Um, but yeah, it's, there's, yeah, it, there's some good in it. You just have to, I, I think it could be, I can imagine someone reading this and getting the wrong impression of, of this type of person, but um, yeah, it might've overall, it might've just been like kind of shifting emphasis and maybe some clarification um that was necessary in there but uh yep moving on to the next one